Okay, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Yes, we are a webinar. You can call us that. We won't be too offended. Um, <laughs> where we cover anything that may be interest, of interest to librarians. Uh, we do these sessions every live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. And they are recorded, so if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. You can always go to our website and watch all of our recordings that are out there. Um, and we do all sorts of things in the show, presentations, mini training sessions, uh, interviews, uh, book reviews. Um, basically, if it's related to libraries, we'll put it on the show. We're not very picky. Um, we'll that. <laughs> it's a little bit. Uh, we have Commission staff, Nebraska Library Commission staff that come on the show and we do some kinds of guest speakers. Today we have Commission staff. Um, next, sitting next to me is Michael Sowers, who is the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Morning, Krista. And anyone who's a regular may know that Michael does usually have a monthly show called Tech Talk with Michael Sowers that he comes on and did, but he already did that earlier this month. Um, this is a, I don't know, special on the fly, an extra, I don't know what uh, you want to sure. call it. <laughs> session that, that he is doing us uh, for us. It is about technology and libraries. Um, it's not as specific his uh, monthly tech talk though. It's a, a special presentation type thing. And usually on the tech talks you bring someone else on to talk yes, anyway. Yeah, it's not typically. your it's not presentation. Me, yeah. yeah. So um, I'll just hand over to you and you can take right. it away and do Great. your thing. Thank you Krista. Yeah. Uh, so what we're uh, going to do today is uh, I uh, what am I talking about? Technology in libraries, what's next? Um, I gave this presentation uh, literally just a week ago at the uh, Northeast Florida Library Information Network, Neflin, uh, down in Jacksonville, Florida, and Krista was also asking me, hey, you got anything you could, you could do on the show? And I thought, I think this would be a great uh, session to do. It's, it's uh, designed to be a little lighter, a little more uh, fun. Um, yes, we're going to talk tech, but not in too much detail. Um, and so I want to start out with a kind of a couple of uh, the things about the framework of this presentation. One, yes, it's called technology and libraries, what's next? But some of the tech I'm going to talk about is kind of out there, and I don't know if or how it could be used in libraries yet. Some of it's not even like commercially available sort of thing. So by the time we get to the end of this, we're getting out into like seriously, not even cutting edge, but bleeding edge uh, sort of stuff that's coming down the pike. So part of this, will, will, you might see something I talk about and go, well, how can I use that in the library? Well, I don't necessarily have a direct answer for you. Yet. That's kind of, yeah, yet, or even, you know, today, that's something that maybe you need to figure out. Maybe it's appropriate for your library. Maybe it's not. Maybe it will be in five years. So I am going to kind of break this into uh, three different categories, kind of the current stuff that you may not be aware of or may not be used in your library. Uh, then part two is kind of the stuff that's just kind of out and really new and you may have heard of, you may not have heard of, and then part three is going to be the uh, stuff that, um, in at least one case, I found out about it last week. So, you know, um, you know, two days before the first time I gave this presentation, I'm still updating it. So This is why we do a tech talk every month. Yes, <laughs> because there is stuff to do. <laughs> so, um, let me start out by making sure that I can actually change my slides. There we go. Um, no, nah, keyboard works. Uh, so, this is Douglas Adams, and he, in one of his later novels, uh, talked about the uh, three rules of technology. And I know Krista has heard this before. And he said, I've come up with a set of rules to describe our reactions to technologies. Number one, anything that is in the world when you are born is normal, and that's how the world works. Okay? So you're born with it. We, we talk about millennials and kids, the iPad generation now. The iPad's just always been there for them. They're getting used to it. Number two, anything that is invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new and exciting and revolutionary, and you can probably get a career in it. So this internet thing kind of happened between I, when I was 15 and 35. Um, I did get my first computer at 13, uh, and I kind of have a career in it. So, so that pretty much works. Um, number three, anything invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. <laughs> I don't agree with now, that. I mean, uh, okay, it varies from people, but but kind of I, I kind of said I had three sections to this. I'm, I'm literally not, you know, the stuff I'm going to talk about in the first section is not literally when you're born, but it's kind of the stuff that's already there and most of us are familiar with, just maybe not using it, then kind of the really, really interesting stuff, and then the 
wow, that's really going to change things if it actually kicks in. So that's the kind of thing. And we'll throw in here this uh, wonderful image from uh, 1906 in Punch Magazine about how these uh, students here, it says, these two figures are not communicating with each other. The lady is receiving an amatory message, and the gentleman some racing results. And if you notice the little uh, antennas coming out of their uh, hats there, yeah, um, that's been making the rounds online. Uh, so this whole concern about how kids are using technology and how technology is changing the way we interact with each other, it's nothing new. <laughs> so anyway, so let's uh, jump in here and do part one. And we have uh, Beaker there introducing us to newish to libraries sort of technology. So like I said, some of this stuff you may already be aware of. One is content management systems. Um, at this point, uh, WordPress, Drupal, Joomla, um, I, when I surveyed my audience last week, I, I asked, you know, how many of your libraries are still hand coding all of their HTML and their CSS on their web pages? And I, luckily, I only had about four people raise their hand in, in a room of about 30 or 40 people. So that was pretty good. Content management systems are not really new, but a lot of libraries still aren't using them. And I think as somebody who's even written books on how to hand code HTML and CSS, I really think we kind of need to move away from that a little bit and start automating these processes a little bit. It doesn't hurt to still know how to hand code. It will always help you in the long run, but things like that. And just throw in the pitch here, the Nebraska Libraries and the Web Project runs on WordPress. And we've got now more than uh, 50 libraries here in the state uh, running that with us. And, and uh, no code necessary, uh, just uh, running their websites and doing a great job with it. Um, audio, video, digital converters. Uh, this is actually, I, I threw this in because it's a project I'm actually working on here at the commission. We have uh, VHS cassettes. Uh, we also have one-inch video cassettes, which I don't know where we're going to find a machine for that. But we're slowly but surely co converting content that we had from VHS to digital. And this little box, which runs about 50 bucks, does it. You plug one end into the VCR, you plug the other end into your laptop or computer with a USB port, and you play the tape, and you hit record on the computer, and you get a digital file that you can burn to a DVD or do upload to YouTube or whatever with it. Um, the, the ultimate thing here I want to kind of imply is that kind of moving that old format content and migrating to newer formats, something that libraries really need to be paying attention to, digital preservation, that sort of thing, archiving, you've got to keep those formats up. In fact, we had to go buy a VCR to even be able to do this project. Archivists shall have one of these. Yes, yeah, you really need one of these. And there are libraries who are actually providing this as a service. They'll, they'll have a machine with a VCR hooked up so people can bring in their tapes and digitize them uh, right there in the public library. So I think that's a, that's a great little uh, project for that. Now I will also throw in, um, you know, we're not talking about digitizing uh, commercial videos like Disney tapes or things like that. May, yeah, Chris is like, oh no. Make sure you own the rights to, to that content. It is something that you can uh, legally digitize. So in our case, it's um, presentations that were given all the way back to the 1970s in some cases. It's, it's been fun kind of digging some of that stuff out. Uh, tablet computers. Uh, most of us, I would assume, if you're on, you know, watching this show, you're familiar with a tablet computer, with your iPad or your Android tablet. But how are you, if at all, using them in the library kind of in an organized fashion? Um, some of your staff may have tablets, but are you using it as part of the workflow? Are you using them to actually do reference work? Uh, things like that. You know, there are libraries out there that instead of sitting the... Um, staff down at a reference desk and expecting people to come up to them, they will actually walk up to people with the iPad and do reference work with the patron right there standing in the stacks. Um, kind of that mobility, uh, that ease of use, I think it's something that uh, you definitely uh, might want to start thinking about. Um, Square, this is just one example, but mobile payments. Um, a lot of us are doing uh, self-checkout machines, things like that, but what if you could you know, pay fines right on that iPod? Uh, uh, excuse me, on that iPad as you're walking around and saying and things like that. Or if you uh, are out at an event and can take uh, fines. Square is just one example. PayPal has another one. I actually just at, at um, a conference back in March did my first Square payment to anybody. It was really fun. It was also the person who was selling to me their first Square payment. As a receiver, met a fellow librarian. She was an author. She had some of her books with her. She sold me a book handed her my credit card, she swiped it through this thing, I signed right on the screen and it emailed me my receipt and it was so easy to do. And uh, I'm not sure if any libraries that I'm aware of are actually doing this yet, but mobile payments, uh, definitely something to think about. 
Also, there are newer payment systems that don't even need this. You kind of wave your phone at the computer and it, um, it uh, transfer a payment through something called near field communications. There's another mobile payment system that I find even more interesting where um, you walk into, say, the coffee shop. The coffee shop is using this system and you have this system on your phone. Um, the coffee shop, by the fact that your phone went in and it's geolocation, they now know you're in the store. And so you just say, hey, I'm Michael, I want to pay for my coffee with this. And they look at their screen and they see your picture because you're in the store and they go, yep, that's you. And they just tap your face and uh, it debits from your account. I think that's uh, pretty cool. Uh, nobody here is doing that Lincoln that I'm aware of or else I'd be trying it out. <laughs> Um, smart watches, hard to see, but holding on my wrist here in the little corner here, I have one of these. This is called a Pebble. Um, this does sync to my phone. So you can't do a lot, a lot with it. You can't, for example, reply to a text. But if I get a text message, it actually does show up on my wrist. Now you're thinking, well, why don't I just look at the phone? Well, That's what I wondered. I not always I convenient car. Uh, while we were driving, did a lot of driving last week. Uh, that was uh, noticeable. Depends on what. Well, <laughs> that's still not cool. No. Not you've still, never you looked at your watch. On your watch. Well, no. Okay, I'm not. Well, okay. The screen's only so big. Yeah. And I can. Okay, let me let me change it up just a little bit. Okay. And you know, I, I'm not disagreeing with Krista. I, I mean, that I, example I mean, is too dangerous okay. to me. If you ask. Me phone that rings. <laughs> You're driving. Phone rings. I can see on my wrist who's calling and I can then ignore it or pull over and answer the call instead of picking my phone up off of the dash and, and trying to figure out who's calling. I, I will admit for me this thing is a toy. I, I mean I got it because I could but there are other smart watches coming out. There's another one uh, that's a Kickstarter project right now. This Pebble was a Kickstarter project. We'll talk about that in a few minutes uh, where uh, there is actually a microphone built into it so you can actually talk back to it. Um, this one doesn't do that. You know, the Dick Tracy. Yeah, kind of a Dick Tracy watch. So um, something to think about. I'm not saying it's for you. I'm not saying it's for everybody. But it is the smart watch technology. Although it's been tried before, this is kind of the next time around just to see how well uh, it can work and if it catches on or not. Um, on my other wrist is something called a Fitbit. Um, this particular version I have is a Fitbit Flex. And uh, all of this is kind of leading somewhere. In this case, this is my uh, pedometer. Um, it also tracks my sleep cycle, so it can tell me about how fast I got to sleep and how many times during the night I was woken up. Uh, it gives me a, a weekly report of my steps. Uh, I can log lots of other things with it manually, such as what I've eaten, things like that. Basically, it's personal data collection. Um, you can also gamify it to see you know, if you've done more steps than your friends, things like this. Um, these have been around for a little while. There are other ones. Uh, Nike Fuel Band is another version of this. Uh, this is the particular one I have. Uh, ultimately, I track my steps for our uh, state health care wellness program, so it gives me a discount on, the, on, on my uh, health insurance. But I can go back, and all of this is being logged into an account that I can decide what to do with. I can track things. I can uh, share it if I want to. I can look at long-term stats. Uh, the most interesting use of this uh, that I read about recently, especially with the uh, tracking your sleep cycle, was a, a couple where the wife was pregnant. They tracked their sleep cycle, and then they were kind of able to figure out, um, I think it was like the husband, it worked better for him to get up earlier in the night with the baby and her later in the night with the baby because of, how their sleep cycles worked, and they were on, yeah, see, so, I mean, you know, obviously that's not going to be directly um, appropriate to you, uh, or probably anybody in the audience at the moment, but, you know, maybe it's just kind of a, once you have the data, then you can decide what to do with it. You can't necessarily do anything unless you have that data in the first place. Now, if you think this is a little weird, the next one gets even weirder. This is called a Mimoto. This is a $279 device. I do not have one of these. Okay? You clip this thing to your shirt, and it has no buttons whatsoever, and as long as you're wearing it, it takes a photo every 30 seconds. Of what? Of whatever you're oh, looking out. at, out from you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Chris is, Chris is giving me the stink eye on, no, the, on this I'm one. Like, right. um, I've it seen takes, people, that sounds like those things where people put a camera around their cat's neck and then let it yeah. photograph, and they see where their cat went wandering in the neighborhood. Yeah, well, this is you. Yes. 
Okay. Takes a, a photo every 30 seconds, geotags the photo so it, it knows where you were at the time, um, and then archives all of those photos for you so that you can kind of log where you have been uh, geographically and photographically. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how I feel about this. Um, if it was 100 bucks, I'd probably get one. 279 is a bit much to get something to play with like this. Uh, but um, it's, it's just, again, more data. And so these, these next several, the previous few things, the next several things, just keep thinking more data, more data, more data. I'll get to a, a point with that. Um, the Nest thermostat. Chris, have you heard about this? This has been around a little while. Uh, this is a online, remote controllable, loggable, and intelligent thermostat for your house. Um, and I did finally in Florida last week meet somebody in the audience who said she has one of these and she loves it and has actually, you know, uh, saved money on her power bill because of it. I love the programmable um, thermostats. Yes, you can ch have it turn on. Right. Not have your AC on all day long when you mm -hmm. really don't need it. Have it turn on an hour exactly. before you come home. Oh, yeah, I, yes. I love that. Yeah. Well, this takes it to the next level because it's online so you can control it with your phone. So if you're going to suddenly be home early today, you can mm. log in and say, hey, you know, turn on the air, turn up the heat accordingly. I'm going to be home in a half an hour. Um, but then ultimately what it starts to do is it starts to learn your cycle and will adjust accordingly because through the app it also knows when you're home and when you're not. Mm -hmm. Because on your phone, your phone knows where you are. Geo, yeah. yeah. So, again, it, it's, uh, it's getting into a little more smart technology, and, again, it's collecting data about now how you heat and cool your home and where you are in relationship to that. So, again, more data, more data. Waze. This is pretty cool. Okay. Krista, you've, you've used Google Maps, right, for just directions stuff? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. The, All right. Yeah. yeah, just Google Maps, navigate. Give me, give me directions on your phone. Mm -hmm. Okay. I used this on a road trip last week. We drove 3,200 miles. Mm -hmm. And this is directions, uh, just like Google Maps does or Google Navigation does. But on top of that, Google will just say, hey, drive from point A to point B. Here's how we're going to get there. And it does know where you are based on your, the little arrow it puts you on, on the map. This does all of that and more. The one thing it does is it also tracks basically your speed based on how fast you're you're getting from point A to point B. Okay. With no hold on. No, no, oh, right. somebody has a comment? Okay. Let me finish explaining this, then we'll we'll have Chris to share the comment. Um, and then if you can see in the example there there's like a four and a three uh, or a four and a two kind of towards the, the middle right there. What it's doing is it's keeping track of the fact that other users of Waze are also driving through that area and the average Waze user is only going four or two miles an hour right now. So you may want to avoid that area. Because mm, there's obviously a slowdown. Because there's something. obviously a slowdown. Mm -hmm. um, then you can see on some of the other Waze user icons, there's little like exclamation points or little cars. People can report um, traffic jams. People can report vehicles on the side of the road. And so as I'm driving down the highway, it would tell me, hey, I've gotten a report that 2,000 feet ahead of you, there is a vehicle on the side of the road. You might want to pull over and give them some room. Or there's a cop hiding behind a tree. We got a couple of reports of, of, of those. Or there's just a cop on the side of the road. Um, you can confirm or deny that the problem still exists as long as it's on your side of the road. There is kind of voice control for this. You don't necessarily have to be, you know, tapping on the screen while you're driving. Uh, in fact, if you try doing that, it will ask you to confirm that you are the passenger and not the driver. Now, you can lie, um, but the idea is the passenger should be controlling and reporting and things like that. And in a few cases, it actually did reroute us around things that we did not know were coming up. It was very, very handy. Now, the punchline on all this is they were just purchased about a week or two ago by Google. Yes. I Do you know how that. much they paid for this? How much Google paid for this? Uh, One billion dollars. <laughs> yeah, and it's being investigated. Is it? it? Oh, now see, I no, no, I have not heard this. See, I've been on the road, so the FTC is now investigating the purchase. Interesting. So. Under what grounds? Do you know? I'll have to look into it. Antitrust. Antitrust. Could Interesting. Okay. One headline. Um, why Google's $1 billion Waze deal faces U.S. antitrust scrutiny is what Time Headline says. Interesting. So, okay. yeah, 
All right. Okay. I was unaware of that. I had not seen that story yet. I was so wondering. interesting. Yeah. No, I didn't. Um, and there was a comment that came through. Is oh, that the? Yes. Yeah. Let's. Um. Do, 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 do. Well, this is actually about Ness. The okay. Thing. Sure. Sorry, it was a little delayed. That's all right. Or I saw it. Um, Julie Erickson, who's up in South Dakota. Hi, Hello. Julie, says um, she works from home. I work from home. My hubby wants to get one so he can turn the heat down remotely when I turn it up. <laughs> <laughs> but we haven't got one yet. <laughs> Dueling iPhones so, controlling the yeah. heat in the house. Yeah. Um, uh, Julie, I, I think gut reaction, only knowing what little bit you said, I'd side with you. But <laughs> anyway, um, so if, I don't know if that will help or hinder, hinder your case, but I'll side with you on this one. All right. So where am I going with all this? I, I, a lot, I keep saying data, 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 data. Big data is just more of a concept than a thing. Um, According to uh, the International Data Corporation, in 2012, we reached uh, 2.8 uh, zettabytes or 2.8 trillion gigabytes of data created. And by 2015, they're expecting to double that. Now, Krista, since you're sitting here, have there been any big data stories recently that you may have uh, heard about? Should I know this? I don't yeah, know. you should. What? The NSA thing? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's big data. data. That's yeah. just collecting everything. I'm not going to get into the politics of the NSA story. But if you're not familiar with big data as a concept, the idea of the NSA just collecting every piece of data they can get their hands on, that's big data. The idea is that once you have it, then you can analyze it. Okay. Um, so, like I said with the Fitbit Flex and my steps and my sleep cycle. Once I have it, then I can analyze it. Um, and so... One of the things I want libraries to be thinking about is we've kind of been big data in that collecting lots of stuff and letting people go through it. Well, now it's not physical items. It's, it's data. It's electronic data. And how can we participate or help people manage that data? We don't have an answer, but it is coming. And that screenshot is from a show called Person of Interest, in case anybody in the audience watches that. That's that's a big data oh, yeah. show. Oh, I mean, that is just about. that's exactly what this show is about. Now it's kind of at the just past the creepy line, and just past the reality line, but it's not that far off. I mean, there's no you know artificial intelligence analyzing all this data yet, but uh, you know we'll we'll maybe get there eventually. Okay, so let's get a little bit away from data for just a minute and talk about crowdfunding. Uh, Chris, have you ever done a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo yes. uh, campaign? You mean um, funded? Funded one, yes. Gave it. Okay, cool. Um, um, not. not do, you, do you care to share what? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> on Indiegogo, I have um, submitted. A, there was a movie, a ferret movie. Okay. Um, someone, a, a, a director up in Canada. She has ferrets, as people may or may not know. I have had ferrets. We have in our family, and she did a movie about um, uh, ferrets. Ferret. Yeah. Ferret, okay. <laughs> But anyway, <coughs> she did it through Indiegogo, and we submitted, put money to it, sure. and so we got a copy of the DVD with the um, the fair, her ferret's paw print on it. Ah, um, okay. Uh, Potograph, so yeah. And Potograph. she's got a new one she's doing now called The Magic Ferret, another one that she's funding through it as well, mm -hmm. a second one, so it's, um, and she's actually got a movie that's, um, this is an independent one, that's being done, um, Hollywood movie. Oh, great. That she's okay. got option for. But yeah, so I did do it through that. Oh. And, yeah, I funded several uh, books, uh, some art books, uh, some fiction, uh, mm -hmm. a couple movies. I, I, I've gotten various things. Lots of people do games. Gaming, create, right. They're creating their own board games or... Huh? Yeah. The, the idea, if you're not familiar with it, Kickstarter is one service, Indiegogo is another, and, and there are others out there, but these are kind of the two big ones, is that uh, somebody has an idea for a project, such as maybe a Pebble smartwatch. And so they say, okay, but we don't necessarily have the money for it. We don't really have, uh, you know, an investor that can give us the anywhere from a thousand dollars to, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars to to do this. So we are going to put the project up. Uh, say, please give us money. Um, and depending on how much money you give, you usually get some sort of reward, such as a, a you know a watch or an autograph on a, on on a, the book, things like that. Um, and I've seen films where, like, if you give a certain amount of money, they'll actually come to you and do your private screening of the movie and, mm. and things like that. But usually you're giving, like, 10 grand at that point because, you know, yeah. there's travel and things like that. Um, and so uh, if they, they – it's usually like a 30-day cycle. If they get the money they're asking for, then they will actually go into production with whatever the thing is. 
No, it is not 100% guaranteed. You, you are taking a chance. If they don't meet their funding goal, you don't pay any money at all. Um, if they surpass their funding goal, they then usually start what's doing called stretch goals, which means like, okay, we only wanted 10 grand, but if we get 20 grand, we'll, we'll, we'll improve the product or, or we'll, we'll give you know, more bonuses to people, things like that. Or they'll yeah, improve the, yeah, improve uh, the actual thing they're doing as well. Right. The, the movie that I did, it was her own personal thing. And then once she broke, she, oh, she made more than enough. She said, well, now if you give me this much more, I can actually hire, um, because it was about a ferret out in the woods and living in the woods, you know, being out. I can hire um, animal wranglers and have other real animals in the movie as well. Oh, cool. So like a trained um, raccoon or a horse or whatever, rather than just pretending there was a, 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 a horse yeah. over there. So right. made it more realistic. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Cool. I might want to borrow that. <laughs> uh, sounds like fun. Um, so bring it back to libraries for just a moment. There have been a couple of library projects that I'm aware of. I'm sure there's been more. Um, the uh, the uh, Fab Lab at Fayetteville Free Library was partially funded through an Indiegogo project. Um, and I believe there's currently a Kickstarter project for a public library to put a Hulk statue outside of the library. They did it. They made it. Oh, yeah. right. Uh, to they promote their uh, graphic novel collection. Somebody so. donated a Somehow it got done. I remember seeing the headline. Okay. Oh, wow. Yes. Wonderful. I don't think I contributed to that one. Um, I did contribute to a uh, bronze HP Lovecraft bust, which is going to go in the Anatheum Library in, in um, 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 uh, Rhode Island, Providence, Rhode Island, uh, where, where he was uh, from. So, you know, it could be our projects, books, things like that. But, so if your library is looking to do a project, this might be a way to fund it. If you can get enough people in your community or just in the larger community of library lovers to uh, participate, it is something to think about. Um, one word of warning, I would maybe talk to whoever the powers that be, city attorney, that sort of thing. Make sure this would be kosher for you to do within your political environment. But beyond that, uh, I, don't, I don't see why uh, more libraries couldn't do this. Um, library box. We've had Jason Griffey on the show. Uh, do we have him on about library yeah. box? We yeah. did. Okay, we did a whole show about this. So go back and look through the archives. But it's basically a way to uh, you know, wirelessly deliver content. He he put in a little in a cutout book there, as you can see. Um, but basically, it's a it's a last f August. Last August. Thank you, Krista. Um, it's about a little forty dollar box. Maybe a total of about a hundred dollars worth of materials. Uh, you put content on it, and then people can connect to it wirelessly and download whatever sort of content that you want to distribute to them, in his case, ebooks. So um, I will stop talking about that and let the people just go back and uh, take a look at that show. Uh, 3D printers. I, I, we've talked about these before. Uh, I'm going to throw them in here. Uh, the one in the lower right there is actually a $403 3D printer you can get uh, through the Sky Mall catalog <laughs> called the Cube. I mean, so if it's hit Sky Mall, these things are kind of hitting mainstream. Um, there's another, I think it's a Kickstarter project to get one down to under $100, actually. Um, now, it's, you know, the smaller the machine, so, the smaller the stuff it can make. So about you'd be able, you either can or will be able to buy one at Staples? Yeah, Staples, the Cube. I think uh, Staples also um, sells that Cube one. So, uh, yeah, you can now just go buy these at, at the store. But and and as much as you know the little rocket ships and that oh I got I got I'm gonna throw in here if anybody uh, here has access to a 3D printer uh, somebody just published plans for a TARDIS transformer uh, toy that oh, it, it opens okay. a, it's a police box it opens up into a transformer and it's all 3D printed and you print out the models and put it together anyways but a little more seriously than that um, actually this is a 3D printed um, uh, Trachea, basically that actually saved a child's life recently, mm -hmm. um, and uh, links to all this will be in the in the show notes. Uh, you can read the story. But uh, his airways couldn't handle it. His airways were collapsing, and they actually modeled and printed him a new trachea, mm -hmm. and uh, saved his life. So, three uh, D printing is is coming along and and getting very very real, uh, in some cases. Um, wireless charging uh, is a new technology. Now you you would the you uh, still have to plug the pad into the wall, but then you set your phone on the pad and it charges the phone without physically connecting a wire to it. Uh, I would love to see a library starting to like offer uh, 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 inductive charging pads for, for people with, with those types of devices uh, right in the library. Basically set your phone here and it will recharge. Now, your phone or your device has to support this feature. This is not just going to work on any phone. 
Um, but more and more phones are coming out with this inductive charging. That is pretty much the way it's going to go is, is wireless wireless charging. And wait till we get to a little further with the wireless tech, uh, um, uh, power generation. Uh, near field communications, I didn't mention this briefly a little earlier about um, if you've ever done the wave your credit card at the little pad, well, this is just now wave your phone at the little pad. It's the same basic concept. Um, you can think of it kind of like RFID, but slightly different technology and works at a much uh, shorter distance. Um, so uh, RFID can work up to like I think about a foot. This will work in a matter of inches. Uh, so you have to get really close. So you can't accidentally walk by it and have something go Generally off. Generally not. Have to be, yeah, yeah. You, you really kind of have to, purpose. you yeah. don't have to touch it, but you got to get pretty darn close. So I'm just thinking, you know, maybe uh, it's mostly used for payment systems right now, but maybe eventually self-checkouts. You know, it's going to wave the thing. RFID's kind of the, the same concept. So I, I'm not saying self-checkout is available in this format yet, but uh, something that if you're thinking about, you might want to, Consider and see how far off it may be, because for all I know, it could, somebody could put it out next week. <laughs> uh, okay, let's talk a little hardware. Uh, HDMI Android sticks. These are pretty cool. Um, this particular one from uh, Genia Tech will cost you about 50 bucks, and you plug it into the HDMI port of your television. Uh, it's got a little antenna there, and it turns your television into basically an Android device uh, where you can install apps and uh, uh, wirelessly stream video and watch your Netflix without hooking up a full-blown computer or a, a good-sized box like a, a Roku or a popcorn box. This is literally just a little stick. You just plug it in and off you go, and it's got a full Android operating system on it. And uh, uh, Then connect like a wireless keyboard or something like that, and your, your TV is now a, a full-blown Android uh, home entertainment system. So for 50 bucks, yeah, it might be something you want to try out. Okay, Arduino. Arduino has been around for a while. Uh, Arduino is a microcontroller, and basically what it's used for, and I'm getting kind of super geeky here, even past my skill level, um, you use it to monitor and control physical world devices. So you get this board, you then program the board and hook extra things to it to do things. The one example I can come up with off the top of my head may seem silly to some people, but you take an Arduino board, you hook up a moisture sensor to it, then you program it to say when it reaches below a certain moisture threshold, do something. So what you do is you then stick the, the moisture sensor into a plant, into mm -hmm. dirt, and then if it gets below a certain moisture threshold, send a tweet saying, please water me. Okay. <laughs> I, know, I thought you were going to say something a... more helpful. Okay, well, <laughs> like okay. You... Moisture sensor in the basement when it starts flooding. That would work too. Turn okay. on the sump pump. Sure, that actually would be like possible. That. Like an automated. Uh -huh. You could do that. Or let us know that, let us oh know God, that there's, your there's water in the basement. Right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, okay. <laughs> my sister could use that. Okay. <laughs> now, you'd have to program it to do that. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, this is, this is you know, you can, the, for your basement, you might want to just buy one of the little frog things that just sits on the floor. Have you ever seen those? And, and mm -hmm. there's, there's, Moisture sensors you can buy. You just sit on the floor and then it sets off an alarm. If it, oh, you know, okay. anyways. Um, well, so, when you're not home, like something that won't do you any good. Right, home. exactly. Yeah, yeah send, send a text message instead of a tweet or something like that. Okay, moving on from there, and I actually have one of these, the Raspberry Pi. These are cool. Ultimately, this is a $35 personal computer. And it's just a little bit bigger than an Altoids tin. Okay? That's it right there on your screen. Um, it comes with two USB ports, an Ethernet port, a uh, video port, uh, expansion board, and an HDMI out video out connector also. Um, and it has a spot on the underside where you can slide in an SD card. The idea is you install an operating system on the SD card, you plug it into keyboard, mouse, monitor, and you have a $35 computer. Comes without a case, comes without an operating system. But you can also connect it then to things like Arduinos and cameras and various other things that you can do with it. Um, I've got one. I've been playing with it. You could turn this into also a full-blown home entertainment system if you wanted to. Um, I've turned mine into an ebook delivery system uh, computer once you can uh, hook it up to uh, Wi-Fi instead of plugging it into the wall. Um, 
there are programming packages that come with it. So if you're looking to uh, teach kids how to program, there's some uh, how, how to program for kids programs that you can get for it, uh, teach them various uh, languages, Scratch being one of them. So um, just, you know, somebody asked me recently, okay, you got a $35 computer, what are you going to do with it? Well, okay, that's like saying, I just bought a $3,000 laptop, what are you going to do with it? It's whatever you want to do with it. Is it the most powerful thing in the world? No, but it's virtually indestructible and only costs $35. So, you know, it's probably about as strong as your cell phone. So, uh, you know, just uh, something to play with. Library use that I've thought of is if you're looking to, <clears throat> say, hook up a large television to run PowerPoint slides behind your reference desk, something like that, instead of wasting a full-blown $1,000 desktop computer, do it with this. Just set that on the desk or just mount it right, right on the wall behind the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the TV. So... All right, uh, so on the horizon. Okay, so now we get into some stuff that's a little more interesting uh, and kind of coming. Uh, faster Wi-Fi. Currently, the standard for Wi-Fi that most people are using is called uh, 802.11G, which will get up to 54 megabits a second for 460 feet. Uh, some of us are running N, which is 150 megabits a second for up to 200 or 820 feet. Right now, you can buy some equipment for what's called AC, and that will get you up to a gigabit per second over Wi-Fi, and then AD is currently under development, and uh, just as a specification, 7 gigabits per second of uh, over Wi-Fi. So speeds well past what your wires are probably doing for you right now, but over the air. That is coming. They are working on it. Um, the Leap Motion. Chris, have you seen these things? These are pretty cool. Uh, this is a, a little, uh, you can go all minority report. Uh, on, yeah. on it, basically. Oh, you, yeah, okay. yeah, you set this in front uh, of your I've computer. I've seen articles about it. I didn't remember the name of it. Yet. Yeah, okay. you set this in front of your computer, and then instead of touching the screen, you just wave at it. <laughs> and it actually can tell what you're doing. Um, Asus laptops are starting to come with this built in. Now, i got to admit, I might get tired waving at my screen mm -hmm. after a while. I don't know, but it's just mm -hmm. kind of a neat little uh, technology. You can tell where your fingers are, where your hands are. You can rotate things and you know, move to the next page and, and things like that. Uh, and eighty dollars. So uh, for, not oh, it's for the the device. That for the device, the thing yes. Back. So okay. that little thing in the guy's hand is eighty. Not bucks. the lap. Not no, the not the laptop. <laughs> yeah, no, not the eighty dollar laptop. Um, but uh, yeah, so I I don't know if those laptops are out, but Asus is is planning on it. Ah, Google Glass. Okay, everybody's probably heard of Google Glass. Uh, right now, it's only available for developers, and it costs $1,500, so I do not have one, although I would love one. Um, so, <laughs> Chris is watching your comments. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I don't know what did much to say here, but, you know, it's got a camera. It's got the on-screen display. You can talk to it. You can touch uh, along the side of your temple there uh, to make it do certain things. It doesn't do a lot yet, but it's for... Developers, developers are, are making software for it and making it do things. And uh, there are some great online uh, video demos. I think I've bookmarked a couple of those. We'll have in the show notes of, of how it actually works and what you can do with it. Uh, so you know, once those prices come down, they are talking maybe about commercial available by the end of 2014. I think they put it off just a little bit. I think if it's under 500 bucks, I'll get one. I think that's about my limit there. I, a grand would be a little too much to, for something to play with. And yes, they do make you look like a complete and total dork. I got that. Uh, so there we go. All right, let's talk TVs for just a minute. Most of us grew up with standard definition television, which is 480 lines. Uh, then we have nowadays uh, what's called full high definition, which is 1,080 lines. Um, so it's called 1080p. 4K televisions are out. That's 4,000 lines of detail. You're practically looking out a window at this point. Okay. Um, there's pretty much nothing being broadcast in 4K. I think like one channel in Japan has tried it out, things like that. Uh, but you can get a 4K TV for under, I think, $1,500 right now. I mean, there are some inexpensive models out there. And you wonder, though, what could I possibly watch at 4K resolution that might look really cool? Well, there has been one movie released in 4K. Ghostbusters! <laughs> wow. 4K Blu-ray, the first one. It is available. It is out. You can't order it through Amazon. 
Uh, if it's not actually out today, they're taking pre-orders. So this uh, is just, you have to have, this isn't like the TV does it, you don't have a special player? You do not have to have a special okay, player. So it's right. TV, it's, it's, player. it's my understanding. Not like having right. to have a Blu-ray player or a Correct. Blu-ray 3D player. You've got to have the TV. It's a TV. Right. Okay. It's, it's a TV. Which I, I, I'm 98% sure I'm, uh, okay. I'm right on that. This, okay, so it's, it's especially on this, it says optimized for 4K. Yeah. So it will play on a regular Blu-ray mm -hmm. player, um, but you'll only get 1080 instead of 4,000. 4, oh, no. Um, so, yeah. Oh, yeah but... Um, so, yeah, I'm not looking to upgrade my TV anytime soon, but because actually I'm going to wait for something else. All right, so that was part two, really short. Part three, this is hold on to your socks, okay? This is where we kind of get uh, really, really weird uh, out there stuff that is not exactly ready yet, and we're immediately going to go to 8K televisions, okay? okay they're going to double it again. They are out there. They're not, you're not going to buy it in a store. It's going to cost you $20,000 sort of thing. Uh, but where 4K TV is 8.3 megapixels, this is 33.1 megapixels. This is probably better than your actual eyesight for most people. <laughs> I mean, it is that clear. You are now looking, not even through a window, you are looking at something, but on your television screen. So I think maybe I'll skip 4K and go directly to 8K. Is there any content for 8K? Not commercially. I mean, you know, they've made some to... Um, show on these displays, but that's about it. I mean, you got to make special cameras to do this stuff, too, so if you've got to create mm. new content. Just like uh, with so. 3D. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, um, the Internet of Things. This kind of is another concept that does kind of tie back to big data. And the idea is that when every single thing in the world is uniquely identifiable and connected to the network. Right now we have things like RFID and NFC and Wi-Fi and QR codes, um, but... You know, this microphone is not really connected to the Internet. It, it is just a thing that is connected to a computer that's connected to the Internet. My watch is not actually connected to the Internet because I have to go through my phone. Um, just, you know, the picture on the wall over to my right is somehow identifiable on the Internet. What are we going to do with this? I have absolutely no idea. But you can read very interesting articles on this concept. Just Google Internet of Things. And you will get people really like thinking 20 steps out of what you can possibly do with this stuff. All right. So if you think Google Glass is not geeky enough, contact lens displays actually exist. Now, it's really hard to see. And I'm going to bring in my mouse pointer here. There's a little dot right there. Okay, let's see, Chris, make sure we can see that. Okay, I'm kind of I pointing at this it, little dot. Yeah, yeah, okay, that is a one-pixel display. They have, okay. they have successfully made a uh, LED, a, a one-pixel LED embedded into a contact lens. What is it? I mean, what's it a picture of? Well, nothing. It's, oh. it's on or off. It's one dot. It's oh. one pixel. Okay. okay. You, can't make, you can't have a picture until you have many more. Okay, but okay. they've gotten the first one. That, that's, see, this, I'm telling you, okay. this is out there no, stuff. No, I get it. At <laughs> so, this point, it would just annoy me and make me want to clean my contacts. Yes. But, <laughs> <laughs> but in the future. Yeah, as, as the article I read said, the display was only one pixel across, but it served as a good proof of concept. Okay, so forget the putting glasses on your face and having to look kind of up to see what's on that display. Mm -hmm. The idea is they would actually be able to display something directly onto a contact lens on your eyeball, okay? Now, I, my, I, I joke, and, but this is true. My, my eyes water at eye drop commercials. I will never wear contacts. I don't care how cool this is. I just can't do it. I don't even wear glasses at this point. Uh, glasses I think I can handle. I just cannot envision putting something up against my eyeball. So this is where now um, it's against the natural order of things when it comes to me anyways uh, for this sort of technology. But, you know. Hey, that's just me. <clears throat> passwords. How many of you hate your passwords? Can't remember all of them. Whatever. Okay. Well, in this case, why do we have to change it every 30, 90 days? Well, that's don't get me started. Um, this is basically a gentleman uh, displayed this at the All Things D conference uh, recently, and he, uh, or excuse me, the D11 conference. That's a different uh, concept. He, he um, is wearing a tattoo on his arm and takes some sort of pill 
uh, to make it work. I, I really don't understand this, but biometrics is like scan your eyeball, scan your retina, or scan your fingerprint. This is just like walk up and wave your arm against this thing and, and it proves you are you because only you would have this tattoo and taking the drug that goes with it. Okay, this is just, this is weird stuff. I've linked to all <laughs> these articles. Okay, you can just, I, uh, this is something like, I, I barely am able to explain it. I just want you to know it exists. Okay, there's this one guy has basically tattooed and drugged himself into being his own password. Okay, enough of that. Uh, we see. Okay, now this is kind of interesting. You've, uh, Chris, you've obviously heard of Connect, yeah. right, where the camera sees you and you move in front of the camera and it can tell what you're doing by the fact that it sees what you're doing. Okay, what this is is the fact that we already have Wi-Fi all around us, which is radio, okay, this guy's set up a system so that by the fact that you're moving and disrupting the Wi-Fi signal by moving through it, mm -hmm. the computer can figure out what you're doing. No camera. It's just reading the no, disruptions okay. in the Wi-Fi. Okay. So you don't even need a camera or that little box, the, 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 the leap motion thing. This is just the Wi-Fi is already there. So if we pay attention to how by your movements you're dis disrupting the Wi-Fi signal, we can tell you, sense your movements. So, you know, and it was in nine gestures, it was about 94% accurate. So limited use, but they're kind of getting there because, you know, these signals are there. Why not? Why don't we actually use them? <sighs> Project Loon. We're almost done. I've just got a couple more here. Uh, Project Loon was actually announced by Google just about two weeks ago now. And what they are doing, they're testing this in New Zealand. They are putting up high-altitude balloons to deliver Wi-Fi. So think weather balloons in the stratosphere. We are be, we are above flight path at this point. And so by putting up these balloons, and you can actually control them to kind of go up and down in their movements just a little bit so they, they don't ever really stay in position, but you can control them so they don't move out of position too much. And uh, then there's a base station. The base station sends the signal up. It then retransmits the signal, and the idea is that... Um, it's uh, wide area Wi-Fi over poorly serviced, low population areas, but faster than satellite because satellites are even further up. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's video, there's pictures. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Project Loon, Balloon, I think, had something to do with it. We'll, we'll just go from there. Yeah, I was wondering why Loon. Was yeah, I right think it's now. Balloon, yes. It. Um, okay. Also New Zealand and Loon's and Sina, anyways, uh, but I think it's the Balloon thing. Project Balloon sounds silly, I guess. I don't know. Um, okay, this is not Wi-Fi. This is Li-Fi. Uh, this is wireless transmission of data using spectrum of light that we can't see out of your LED light bulbs. Okay. okay, so think of, okay, we have light bulbs up in the ceiling here, mm -hmm. okay? And it's putting out light that we can see, but they're also putting out light we can't see, mm -hmm. okay? Now, these happen to be fluorescents, I think, but let's say they're LED bulbs, super efficient, very low power. Well, what uh, these guys have been able to do is actually transmit data over that light using the bulb as kind of the receiver and the transmitter. Wow. Yeah. So forget radio, we're now transmitting via light, which we already do over fiber optics, mm -hmm. but that still uses little glass filaments to do it. This is actually kind of over-the-air transmission via light. Yeah. So, hey. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, cell tower on your desk. Qualcomm is working on a, a little thing where right now... When your cell phone to actually make a data or a voice call, you actually have to connect to a cell tower somewhere in town, usually not that far away. What this is would be a little device, which is not quite a cell phone booster. Okay? You can buy devices that, like, in your house you have a cruddy signal, so we're going to put... This actually is a little mini cell phone tower that anybody within your distance could use to boost that signal instead of being specific to you. This is kind of cool. I think it would be a great thing to put in the library. I mean, you know, just, just sure. to help people in town get better cell phone reception. Yeah, what? if you're in a dead zone or something, uh -huh. and you know it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. My house used to be a dead zone for years, 
and I was unable to, you know, lots of people were switching, ditching their landlines and going cell phone only. I couldn't do it because I had to walk outside to use my cell phone. Oh. So it had to only be like for Oh, wow. Right. But at some point, somewhere. Somebody put it in a tower a somewhere. A new tower yeah. went up somewhere and suddenly, poof, we have cell phone service in the house. Yay. Hey, all right. <laughs> okay, two more. Uh, wireless electricity over a distance. This point, we are now into the realm of Nikola Tesla. <laughs> Which he did. I mean, yay. I mean, good for him. So this is not exactly new. But the idea here is, and I guess the, the best example I can think of is, um, electric car, pull into your garage, and it just wirelessly recharges instead of plugging it into the wall. Okay. You can kind of have direct, so you kind of sync the two things and then and, and charge over a distance. But they're also talking... Uh, you know, distances right now it's just, uh, centimeters to several several meters. So you're uh, not talking, you know, from uh, the mountains to to uh, um, where did Tesla do it? Somewhere in the Rockies to uh, uh, not boulders, uh, whatever. Anyways, we're not talking town to town. We're talking, you know, a distance of several meters, but from milliwatts to kilowatts. So um, basically, the idea of just instead of setting your phone on a pad which is wireless charging but needs that connection, this is actually sending the uh, electricity over the air. So, uh, interesting concept. And the last one, which I, I just added uh, Monday morning last week, uh, I think, to this, is the idea of transmitting data using you as the transmission source. So, for example, if I wanted to say right now, and, um, and, and I'll get to why in a second, transmit something from my phone to my watch. Right now it does do that wirelessly, but this concept would be I would touch my phone and the data would go from my watch to the phone through my hand. Okay? Think more security issues where you want the physical touch to confirm that you are actually there instead of over a distance, things like that. Again, game console I mean, is, is one of their examples they would have there. So um, just, again, something to think about. Uh, back to the security for just a second. Anytime you send something wirelessly, it's possible to intercept it. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to transfer something securely from my watch to my phone, I could just touch my phone and it would go through my hand. That's a patent from Microsoft that they just got, so um, mm. some, something to uh, think about. Uh, so it looks like I have filled the hour. Um, that's how you can get a hold of uh, me, or you can use my uh, email address here at the commission. Whoops, I forgot to change that. Uh, that URL will get you all the hyperlinks. Krista will also be putting them in the uh, show notes. There. They're already in the show notes, so oh, the yeah, archive comes the, up. They're in the commission's delicious account. Uh, you'll be able to find those. And... Um, Thank you. I'm, I'm done. Any question, other questions or comments? I hope at least at one point I blew your mind at least once. And just kind of went, huh? You know, that's really all, all I wanted to do with this presentation. Julie says, super session. Thanks for all the info. Oh, good. Thank you, Julie. And Oh, and personal cell towers were in her newspaper today. Oh, oh hey. All right. Hey, if, if it's online, send me a link. I, I, I'd love to read the article. Um, or, you know, scan the newspaper article. So does anybody have any questions, comments, um, thoughts, freakouts, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> this, one, this one with a live audience is really interesting because I could watch people's faces yeah. kind of be doing the, kind of what you did a couple of times. You're like, huh? Why would I do that? Uh, there was this one guy in the audience that just like, his his head nodding in confusion got worse and worse throughout. I talked to him at the end. He was great. He too enjoyed much it, but, but yeah, he was just like by the end, he's just like stop talking to me. This is too much. It, yeah, it was quite uh, fun. Julie Marlow, different Julie out uh -huh. in California, says, "Wow, all caps." Yeah, great. Yeah. yeah. So um, and I could probably do this next week and have different stuff. So yeah, I was gonna say just, this is just some things, and there's there's all sorts of new technology things coming out. So. Um, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Or what. It's job security. It's job security. Um, embrace them. Try and learn about them. See if you could use them in your library. Some of them maybe not. Not everything. Just like any new thing we've used, like Twitter when it was new and Facebook. It doesn't always work for everyone, but you can see if it will. Um, 
at, at the minimum, knowing <coughs> that these things exist is good for when your patrons come in and say, mm -hmm. I've heard about blah, blah, blah. Can you help me find more information? And you can at least go in and type in the thing and, and, and have some sort of a little knowledge. Or even knowing that there might be something new out there that I haven't heard of yet. So right. let's just type in what this person th says, and maybe they have heard of something that I haven't. Yeah. And some of the stuff, especially towards the end, Nothing may come of it. I, you know, okay, no, Microsoft no got this patent. Yeah. Great, you know, okay, so don't, especially the further through the presentation we got, worry less. Just be aware. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, if it really comes to something, you know, commercial, that you, you'll hear about it. So. Yeah. All right. Doesn't look like any uh, comments or questions or anything are coming through right now. That's great. Um, as Michael said, the... Um, Anything that he mentioned that has links, which were in his list links there, have already been added into the commission's ones that are always put up when the um, recording goes up. Um, this PowerPoint will be up there as well, too, so you have that to refer to, and the recording will be posted um, this afternoon, I don't know, yep. uh, whenever it gets done processing. So, so, thank you very much there it goes, for joining us today. Um, that will wrap it up for this morning. I hope you'll join us next week when we did just add this to this to the schedule. I've been working to try and get this top, this um, presenter on, um, and she finally picked a date. And luckily, it was in is in recent upcoming date, so it's next week. Um, what you should be subjecting your teens to the nonfiction switch. Um, this is a library here, uh, La Vista Public Library has. Um, at the, um, their teens wanted to make a switch of moving from Dewey in their section to a more subject-based uh, classification system. So the Teen Advisory Board and the Teen Librarian, uh, Lindsay Thompson, <coughs> up there um, worked on doing it. So she and another one of the one of the members of their Teen Advisory Board, oh, cool. uh, Sarah Krieber, will be on the line with us. I'm not sure if that's Krieber, Krieber, but Sarah and Lindsay will be on the line with us next Wednesday to talk about how they did this. Um, and what's come of it and how it's going there up at the Teen um, Collection in La Vista Public Library. So hopefully you'll um, join us next week for that. And if you are on Facebook, um, Encompass Live is on Facebook too. There we go. You can like us there and you'll get notifications of when we have new shows coming up, um, when recordings are available, reminders as you can see here. Um, there we go. Of, uh, join us right now for the show we're doing. Um, so you'll get, if you are a big Facebook user, like us there, and you'll get notified when we're doing things and new episodes and jokes. So that will wrap it up for today. I don't see anything new coming in. Ah, Julie sent us a link to the news article in the Rapid City Journal. I will add that to the show notes. Thank you, Julie. Yes, thank you. Um, Verizon cell phone customers in Johnson. I don't know, it's just, the, I can't read the URL. We'll figure it out, but we'll put a link to it in the show notes um, for what she um, found. Sure. All right, so thank you very much for attending, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.